I'm Russ Clark. I'm the creative director for the studio. Um, we're obviously part of the same company as Marmalade, although uh, we, we still have the original name of the company, IdealWorks, but they, they've moved on to something much bluer. Um, so uh, basically I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where mobile gaming has sort of come from and been through the lens of my experience at IdealWorks and um, offer a few thoughts about where it might be going. I hope you find it interesting. I threw this together this morning, so my apologies, it's a little bit rough and I don't have quite as many images as I would normally like to have. <coughs> um, so, oh, looks like I've got some animations here. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I started out working for the legendary stainless software um, back in the day, uh, making Carmageddon. Actually, I joined them uh, just before they released Carmageddon 2, so just before it all went really horribly wrong. Um, I hope there's no correlation between those two events. Um, I was there for a few years, and then by a series of tortuous twists, I won't explain, ended up at Viz Entertainment, I won't say much about, um, in Dunfermline of all places, um, and then sort of meandered my way into mobile technology at the time when the UK games industry wasn't going terribly well. Um, that was Pixel Technologies. Um, and after a few years um, having no <coughs> real creative itch to scratch, um, deciding I desperately needed to get back into games, uh, I heard about IdeaWorks. Um, so I joined in, uh, in 2005. Um, and those are like a few credits of the things that I've done in that time. Um, so reasonably big names. One of the things that's always been great about this company is because of our preeminent position in technology, we've been able to get some, some really nice IPs that um, others would not always be able to get hold of. Um, so I'll talk a little more about some of those things in, in due course. Um, so yeah, mobile games, as I sort of saw it, um, <coughs> started, well, pretty much, I guess, in the late 90s with, with Snake. Um, there's a sort of progression as the platforms have exploded and, and, uh, and followed on. Smartphones, the first things that we called, called smartphones were around in the early 90s and that was uh, things like Series 60, Brew, and so on. Um, back in those days, native access was almost unheard of, and Java was considered to be pretty much the solution to fragmentation for developers. Um, wasn't the best solution the world's ever seen, um, as far as the inequality of, of games that were made uh, at the time, um, for some of the reasons I've listed there, it was a pretty patchy experience. Um, I did wonder while I was languishing up in Scotland wanting, wondering how I'd get back into the games industry whether I should get into doing Java games, but um, really it didn't look like a very fun experience. Anyway, with things like Series 60 and Engage coming along, um, a solution started to emerge for real native gaming, um, and IdealWorks, who had actually been around since I think around 2001, um, saw this massive opportunity and, and jumped on it. Um, so the original forays uh, for IdealWorks were on devices uh, such as the top one you see pictured there. Anyone in the audience have one of those? No one had an Engage? I don't blame you really. It's normally white and fun. Um, and what IdealWorks started out with was actually um, some pretty clever tech for directly converting PlayStation code to run natively on ARM and on Engage. And there's a, I think that's not a a real screenshot with a picture of Tomb Raider there, that was actually uh, one of the titles that they, they did back in the day, Tomb Raider, Bob McRae, THPS, all this before I joined, which was in 2005. Um, at the time I joined the company, the second device you see picture there was, was roughly the, the state of the art. Um, and there was still not very much in the way of what you would call native gaming available, but um, there was plenty of Java stuff. So this is what I would call the first age of smartphones. Um, this, was, um, this was a great time for IdeaWorks. It was, it was kind of a golden age, if you like, because there were really very few other companies out there who were trying seriously to do high quality game experiences natively um, on these kind of devices. Um, so we got to do some, some pretty epic things. A Final Fantasy game, Metal Gear Solid, that was my first title. Uh, System Rush was an IP that we did for, for Nokia. Um, Sims to mobile, um, and all of these things were, were pretty much breaking new ground. Uh, were, there was hardly anyone else out there trying to do things um, as well as we did, and not very many <coughs> succeeded, and so you know, we won awards and it was good times. Um, 
our whole sort of core business, and this was at a time before there was really a separation between IdeaWorks Game Studio and IdeaWorks 3D, now known as Marmalade. Um, our business was based around sort of flagship developments of well-known console IPs um, that we would bring to mobile. We'd, we'd get those contracts simply because no one else could do what we did. Um, and the watchword was all about console quality. Not necessarily because console games on mobile was something that consumers really wanted to play, but because it was an exciting idea, and um, you know, people people like to play pay for flagship stuff that made their platforms look good. So, despite the fact that these games didn't <coughs> really sell very much, I think some of them paid for their development. Um, that that wasn't really the issue because there wasn't really a market to speak of at the time um, in in this this segment. Um, so we had a great time, made some cool games, and then everything changed. Obviously, 2007 we had the iPhone. 2008, we had the App Store. Um, and for the first time, there was something that you could call an actual vertically integrated ecosystem. The hardware was there, the OS, there was a tool solution integrated, uh, there was content, there was a system to pay for that content, there was distribution, there was a discovery framework, all in, in one single solution. And suddenly, there was an actual market that people could make proper money in, and, and it all exploded, as I'm sure we all know. And this precipitated um, a huge change for everyone, um, not least for us. Um, fragmentation, um, obviously Idealworks at this time were feeling pretty pleased with ourselves. We had turned that early technology into a product called Airplay, which is now called Marmalade. Um, and we were busily solving the fragmentation problem, which for a short time became almost irrelevant because iPhone is the only game in town, so why would you, why would you worry so hard about fragmentation? Um, a lot of things changed at that time. So fragmentation sort of disappeared from the, from the table for a while. Um, our software rendering tech pipeline, which was you know pretty much second to none at the time, suddenly became obsolete. Um, and we had to completely reevaluate our whole focus uh, around a hardware-oriented pipeline for games development, uh, totally new asset conditioning requirements, um, totally new ways of building environments to make them work well, uh, new challenges for managing scenes, <coughs> Uh, everything was suddenly touch screen and the size of these assets that we're talking about, I mean, uh, I think when we shipped Call of Duty Zombies it was around 50 megs in the install. Metal Gear Solid was a game that installed in one and a half megabytes and ran in, in four megs of heap. Um, so as you can imagine, it was just a, a totally different ball game in terms of development. Um, we handled this pretty well. Um, so in 2009 and 10, we released Backbreaker Football, which was connected to the Natural Motion license. Uh, kind of a, a nice game with a bit of a tech demo aspect to it. That made it to number one of the pay charts. And later in the year, and then with expansion packs following through 2010, Call of Duty Zombies. Um, that was that was I think top grossing for about six weeks, and it stayed up there for, for quite a long time further. Um, so we did pretty well through some, some challenging times. Um, and there's a summary of, uh, of the way we saw our work at the time. Authenticity, accessibility, replayability, but still very much within the framework of taking console games and putting them on mobile and, and making them work. Um, which nowadays might look like a fairly, fairly outdated way to approach things. So at the same time with this, uh, you had Android appearing, gaining ground, uh, the market appearing in 2009. Um, the, uh, the install base explodes shortly after that, and so it's now actually the, the, the widest installed mobile device. Um, I'm sure plenty of you have seen this graphic before, one of many that depicts the, the nightmare of Android fragmentation. Um, so after a short hiatus, fragmentation was, was very much back on the agenda in mobile game development. Um, exacerbated in the case of Android by the freedom which all the carriers and OEMs had to basically do whatever they wanted with it. Um, and even within the sphere of iOS, um, where the first devices were, you know, was almost like a console with one set of hardware, um, suddenly there were loads of screen resolutions, screen resolutions, different API versions replacing each other, devices on some, uh, uh, hardware devices on, on some of the devices and not others, um, and services that weren't actually available to every single OS revision in, in circulation. So things have complicated again. There's a little graphic. This is actually fairly old now, I think you probably can't see, but I think that goes back early to 2000, 
11 is where that finishes. Of, uh, that's data that we tracked, live data from Call of Duty Zombies, showing the, the progression of um, different devices as they came in and achieved dominance. Um, the thing that really opened our eyes on that was just how big the uh, second generation iPod Touch uh, became and stayed for, for a long time after it was um, replaced by your devices. Um, so this led to uh, eventually what you could see as a, as a coming of age period for, for mobile games, 2010 to 11. Um, that was the point, I think, at which the market for what we had been doing, recreating console experiences, basically disappeared because now um, it was getting dominated by things that were actually designed for mobile. Obviously, casual games came, became massive, Angry Birds, Battle Group, and so on. And even looking at the opposite end of the spectrum, things like Infinity Blade, console like graphics, but very much not a console experience, something designed for mobile, designed for, for casual gameplay and for, for short bursts of gameplay. Um, and during this period, we saw the start of the, the, the new evolution of monetization techniques, which of course you're all familiar with. Um, and that's just, uh, just skyrocketed since then. Um, IGS diversified a fair bit. Um, obviously, we, um, we still kept going on the Call of Duty franchise because we had a good business there. Um, Black Ops Zombie is more or less the same kind of thing as the first game, but, uh, but better. Um, but we also found ourselves doing some, some more modern stuff. Fable Coin Golf, that was, a, that was actually a Windows Phone 7 title. Um, that was a casual puzzle game. Qubit was an IP we did. I'll show you a video of it in a minute. Um, uh, that was uh, basically, a, again, a short gameplay burst um, 3D arcade game for mobile. And we, we got briefly into the companion app space and had some fun with, with the mobile. Um, so, to summarize quickly the things that we've learned going through all this, um, first of all, things changed. Um, everyone knows that things change, but living through the mobile games business for the last five years, oh my goodness, how things have changed. Um, it's amazing how, how fast your reality can shift um, and, and power suddenly moves into the hands of a whole different set of people. Um, disruption is everywhere and it's going to continue to be everywhere. Um, it's not about platforms, it's about ecosystems. That's, that's something we've learned. Um, it's very instructive to look at what Apple did. It wasn't so much a question of inventing anything really new, but putting together existing elements that people had tried and failed with before and building something that was complete and coherent. Um, if you compare that with Android, something that is very dominant because of the way it was um, made free and pushed, um, but has not delivered the same levels of monetization um, at all as, as iOS um, because of the, the difference in fragmentation of the, of the overall ecosystem. Um, discovery is now the watchword because the market has grown so big, um, half a million apps on the store, um, but how hard is it to actually see prominence for things you develop and for them to, to find an audience. Uh, even, even being new isn't enough and certainly being high quality isn't enough anymore. You have to somehow catch both of them and catch a wave um, if you're gonna make it up there. And related to that point, time to market. There is so much uh, content now appearing in markets like the App Store. Um, you just can't afford to be slow anymore because if you take over a year to develop a game like we used to, by the time it's out, it's become obsolete, it's become irrelevant, uh, or if you're unlucky, it's actually been cloned by someone else before you even released it. Um, so moving on towards the future to, to post mobile, the reason I introduced that term is because it seems to me that mobile just isn't a term that we should be using anymore. Um, it's, it's lost its meaning because really what's important in this space is ecosystems, not device classes, uh, not operating systems. Um, all the sort of conventions that we were used to from the old age of mobile gaming have, have, have disappeared. Um, most gaming is no longer mobile. Um, I don't know if you can read this, um, the graph in the top, uh, that's from PopCap, I think. 69% um, of people that they're aware of playing games on uh, smartphones and tablets do it at home on the couch. There's uh, another large chunk in bed. I don't know if they quote how many do it sitting on the toilet, but no. no. Don't tell me you guys don't do it. Um, it's, uh, it, it's no longer a mobile thing. I mean, is a tablet even a mobile device? It's mobile in the same sense that a laptop is mobile. 
But I think that term has, has, has lost meaning and it's misleading to actually to, to talk about mobile gaming anymore, unless you're talking about location away gaming or something that's, um, that's still a bit blue sky. Um, what's happening in the space that we work in is now reshaping the whole industry, and I believe it's no coincidence that you're seeing um, the major platform holders actually delaying their next generation. Um, not because they're not ready, not because as they sometimes claim um, you know, there's life in the old dog yet, but because they want to see what happens in mobile and in digital before they actually commit to putting something new in your living room that might be obsolete as soon as it's released. Um, the, the picture on the bottom there, you've probably seen that one, that's from Apple's patent for a game controller from about a month ago. Um, I don't know how long it's going to be before we see that in our living rooms, but I'm betting not very long. Um, yeah, it's amazing how people can patent things that look exactly the same as other things, but happens all the time. Um, so there's all to play for, and it's, it's very hard really right now to predict what's going to happen, but what you can be sure of is that the big players in what we have been calling the mobile space are going to be making a big impact in the living room and they'll be using their connected up, joined up ecosystems and the other services they've got behind them to, to leverage for a position, a position of strength. Um, in terms of what to do about that, um, when you have a situation of this volatility, you have to be, you have to be agile. Um, it's, it's, I think, folly to try and bet on one ecosystem and decide which one's going to win. They've all got their challenges, their positive sides. Um, what I, my message is that agility is the, is the thing you have to focus on. Um, and obviously, um, it's the marmalade developed day. Uh, Cross-platform readiness is, is a big part of that. I see that as the best hedge against uh, not knowing what's going to happen. Um, the space has been disruptive throughout its history, and it's going to continue to be disruptive. Um, if you were in a position to minimize the amount of work that you have to do, to move to new platforms, then you are maximizing your ability to react to the unknown. Um, and you're also setting yourself up for an opportunity to balance your strategy, bearing in mind it's not just about picking the best ecosystem to go out on, um, it's about picking how to use their different properties. IOS is massive, okay, if you want to go for the biggest sales, you want to be on IOS, um, but if you look at a new platform like Windows Phone 8, there's an opportunity there to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond, to take advantage of some incentives that Microsoft might be offering um, and to use that to boost your image, increase your discoverability, possibly before you go to live source or maybe just as a, a separate part of your portfolio. Um, it's not all just about tech, having the right tech will help this, um, but more and more as this kind of diversity, even within e ecosystems, increases, um, it's about design and it's about readiness, thinking about how your product is going to leverage different characteristics of different environments and the new things that are coming. Um, if, uh, if the Apple console is going to be a reality uh, very soon, maybe now is the time to be thinking about what your control pad interface for your game is going to be and not just assuming that it's touch screen all the way. Um, yeah, so that's all I think. I'm probably only halfway through my time, so um, take questions or I've got a few videos of some of the games I was talking about if anyone would be interested to see them. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Metal Gear Solid Mobile. Or will be when it starts <laughs> on the wrong screen. So I was working on this from 2006 to 2008, mostly. Can you see that? It's kind of bright. Um, and um, mm. oh, that's better. And this went out on Series 60 devices um, and also Brew devices in the yeah, US and Japan. Um, and that's all software rendered based on our proprietary tech that evolved from the stuff that the guys did back in the N-Gage era with Tomb Raider and uh, uh, Tony Hawk's and, and the rest. 
Yeah. How long that time put together? We worked on that for 18 months. By comparison, the last thing we've been working on, which is going to go live in a week, took three and a half months. How many developers would you have working on that? Um, that game had a team, I think a co the core team was probably about 12, and it swelled up a couple of times um, around milestones. Um, the last game we've been working on, I'd say the core team was more like 20, and it went up above that at tough times when we had to put extra people on. Um, the code teams on these projects, to be honest, have not gone up that much. It's mainly the art teams and the design teams required to make all the extra content. Could you talk a little bit about the work between the developers and the art teams? Like, what aspects of the way did you develop the code teams? Because they were quite Well, um, so a game like the one you saw there, or like uh, Zombies, which actually I'll put up a video of Zombies. Um, let me just find that. Okay. Um, so, wrong screen again. This is all built. Um, so, uh, this is all built on the technology stack that is part of um, what was called Airplay Studio. Uh, is it now called Marmalade Studio? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, which is stuff that was sort of separated out from the from the core SDK and, and uh, worked into a separate section of the product. And then, um, well, the history of it is that a bunch of other high-level functionality um, that was never really product-worthy uh, then was separated out from that and um, and turned into what became the studios tech that we worked on. So, the studio has a whole layer of engine tech that sits directly above. Marmalade Studio and interfaces with that. Um, some of the stuff that we depend on for games like this um, is a part of the main Marmalade product, like for example the exporters from Maya. Maya is our content tool of choice. Um, and then a bunch of stuff, we had to write a whole scene graph, a portal engine scene graph for this game um, that we just developed ourselves to sit on top. And to some extent we had to um, we had to extend the core asset formats that the, the Marmalade 3 stuff, 3D stuff depends on. For example, again, the, the model chunking system that Marmalade can use, um, we had to sort of uh, write our own version of that in order to chunk our models up based on portal sector boundaries um, in order to make it work with this engine. Sorry, that's probably not a very specific answer to your question. Are bring in any of that? Sorry? Are the plans to bring in any of to the wider framework of Marmalade? Or if you, mean, that if you mean to provide sort of higher level game engine functionality, yeah. um, there, there would, as far as I'm aware, there are no plans to take sort of this era technology from the studio and productize that. But I believe there are some initiatives underway to evaluate possible solutions for providing um, a high level engine for, for Marmalade users who want it. You'd have to ask the Marmalade guys some more detail about that. Oh, you there. There we go. Me? I'm nobody. What else can I show you? I have a question, Russ. Is it still possible for small game developers to be successful? Or is it now the artwork involved you know, is beyond what you know, one or two people can really achieve? Particularly when you're talking about 3D kind of games. Well, yeah, I was going to say it really depends what you want to make. Um, if you want to make, you know, top end, if you want to compete with Infinity Blade or something, that's a, that's a pretty big ask. But if you look at the stuff that's at the top of the store, you know, most of it is not of that ilk. Um, a lot of it is HTML5 or, or similar looking stuff. A lot of it is 2D, maybe physics based games that you could make with Cocos and Box 2D. Um, the, the market is still, obviously, it's gone very much free to play and, um, you know, resource management and stuff and so on. Um, most of the products that are doing well at the moment are still relatively light on what you call um, end technology, visual technology, um, and big on, on back end metrics and um, design and so on. If you want to do 3D games, you know there are some obviously some engines that you can use out there, and it's still possible to 
make fairly ambitious games with relatively small teams. Um, but you just have to be clever about how you build your content, really. Any more questions for us? Yeah, I are you doing anything with gestural control? Jess, do you mean as in like drawing on the screen or? No, I was thinking Microsoft Connect. That's um, no, we're not. We're not uh, looking at, in the studio, is we're, not, we're not looking at Xbox as a, as a key platform at the moment. We have experimented with some things like that in the past. In Metal Gear Solid, the, um, the Symbian version of that game, we actually um, used the, the preview of the device camera to implement a sort of first person look mode. It was this is before accelerometers, so we would like, you know, analyze the video feed and well, as you moved around and work out vectors and use that so that you could look around in first person in the game. But that was just kind of a little fun experiment rather than a strategic thing. Okay. Any more questions? No? Okay, well thanks very much guys.